I don't know how many of you read the headlines uh, on September 1. Um, most of you weren't alive back in 1939. There are probably a few of you who were, but you may not have been old enough to appreciate what happened then. On September 20, uh, pardon me, September 1, 1939, the country of Poland was invaded by the Nazis. And the 80th um, anniversary of that was being celebrated by a group of people in the town where that was invaded. And the headlines for that, it said German, Germany's president asked for forgiveness for his country on Sunday for the suffering of the Polish people during World War II as Poland marked 80 years since the Nazi German invasion that unleashed the deadliest conflict in human history. Well, I was interested to read the article, of course, and in there, it made the point that it lost about a fifth of its population. And uh, there was apparently about 30 million people who lived in Poland at the time, and they lost six million people, and more than half of them were Jews. Well, I tried to wrap my mind around that, so I looked up uh, what state in the United States has about 30 million people. Well, it turns out that Texas is probably the one that is closest. And for them to lose uh, six million people would be a significant uh, loss. They only had only, I mean, every person is precious in the Lord's sight, but they lost 1,613 people from homicides in 2017, I believe it was. Well, states that have a population of around six million people include Missouri, Maryland, Wisconsin, Colorado, and Minnesota. So it's like losing that many people over the course of, what, three or four years. Well, as I read this story, my mind moved eventually to include two stories that I wanted to share with you. The first one is the Dayuma story. I don't know how many of you read the book. I don't think it was an Adventist publication. But when I was in seventh grade, I think it was, that's when I came across the book. And in this story, it tells of several American families that had um, banded together to take on the um, reaching out to the Aka Nation. It's a tribe of uh, native um, South Americans who lived in Ecuador. And they had kind of a rough history for people trying to make contact with them. Back in 1667, somebody tried to bring the gospel to them, and they ended up being dispatched. 200 years later, there was a commercial enterprise where these rubber, uh, these people who were in the rubber business were trying to uh, harvest that product from their country. And in the process, they raped and pillaged and murdered uh, the Akans, and so the people in, uh, in this tribe had natural reason to fear people because they, were, they perceived them as predators. Well, in the Dayuma story, um, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, um, these missionaries decided to go to fly, and well, I should say this, there was a girl by the name of Dayuma who, whose father was murdered. She was an Aka Indian. And after her dad was murdered, she escaped their uh, tribe and went to um, another city. In that city, she connected with uh, Rachel um, Saint, I think her last name was. And Rachel was a Christian missionary. She was part of this group that wanted to reach out to the Aka nation. In the process of spending time together, she learned the language, and Dayuma learned about Jesus. And um, several years passed, and <laughs> I, I need to make sure I'm not getting ahead of the story because it's, uh... okay, so this was back in 1950s when these Americans gathered together to attempt to reach out. So Nate and his other missionaries decided to fly into the area and start dropping gifts, which they did, and they shattered phrases that they had been taught by Rachel um, uh, from, this, from Dayuma. 
and the natives were waving back and smiling. So that, they thought that was a good sign, so they decided to land on a sandbar, which they named Palm Beach. The men knew it was risky, and one of the men, by the name of Jim Elliott, told his wife, if that's the way God wants it to be, I'm ready to die for the salvation of the Akas. Well, all signs have been good. Uh, they landed on Friday, and there was an Akan couple. Uh, the gentleman wanted to go up in the airplane and fly, and it was just an exhilarating experience, as you can imagine, for this um, primitive person. I mean, he didn't even drive a car. Maybe he has never been in a car, but here he has the opportunity to fly in an airplane, which he did. And so once they got down, he and the woman that was with him they decided to leave and go back. Well, they stayed, and when they got, when this couple got back, something tr terribly went wrong. They were, he was accused of taking this woman as his third wife, and um, so this man had to invent some kind of defense, and so in the process, he lied about what happened. He and this woman had escaped into the jungle together, and their story was now that these uh, American uh, missionaries, I don't know that he had named them that way, but these foreigners had tried to kill them, so they had to escape. So the, the, the decision of the tribal chiefs was not to kill them anymore, but to rally a cry of revenge. And so there were a number of people who responded to that. They were leaders of the village, and one's name was Kimo, and the other was Daiwei. So meanwhile, the missionaries spent Sunday at the beach and they noticed that there were a group of ladies who approached them. And so they engaged them in conversation, that, you know, looking at it as a positive thing where they could um, make friends with these people. But what they didn't realize, it was a trap. And they were being lured by these women while their backs were turned against these six native uh, revenge seekers who threw spears into these guys and killed them. Well, eventually, um, the wives found out what happened to their husbands, but remarkably, they did not beat a hasty retreat from what most would regard a land of savages. Several remained in Ecuador with their children and continued attempts to reach the tribes in the forest. Well, about two years after the missionaries were speared, two women from Dayuma's Aachen village came, had found her. They had no contact with her since running away. The women explained that her mother was desperate to see her. So Dayuma traveled with uh, these women back to the village, and the people were amazed. They assumed that she had been eaten by the white people. She told them that the murdered missionaries had come with a message of peace. They had weapons, but they didn't use them just as God had the power to stop Jesus from being crucified, but didn't. Dayuma explained, just as you killed the foreigners on the beach, Jesus was killed for you. This was a revolutionary concept. They were used to revenge, um, but not uh, making peace. Self-sacrifice was a foreign term. They were all about revenge, holding grudges and killing, and couldn't imagine another lifestyle. Strange white people, they thought. Well, Dayuma returned where she had been staying a few weeks later, but she didn't come alone. She brought five Aka women with their children accompanying her. You know what they were singing? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And they gave a message and this was the message from the Aka leaders. We did wrong to kill those five outsiders. We want to learn to live well. We want to learn to know the Creator God. Tell them we'll build a house for them. Tell them to come. Well, Rachel discussed this extraordinary opportunity with Elizabeth, who was the wife of one of the pilots or one of the missionaries who flew in. Would they be crazy to? live with people who had killed their relatives? Well, one month later, Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, and Jim Elliott's widow, Elizabeth, 
hung their hammocks with the Akas. They began living out their forgiveness day after day in the Indian village and pointing to its source in the atonement of Christ. Kimo, you remember the name? He was one of the spear throwers. Kimo was the first one to see in Christ, in Christ's blood, a means of spiritual cleansing. Well, Elizabeth had brought her three-year-old daughter, Valerie, and lived with the Akas until 1961. Not only did many Akas become Christians, but even the six killers became Christians. As leaders, these men were highly influential, and they promised that their generation would not kill again, and they kept their word. Interestingly, two of Nate's children, Kathy and Steve, spent summers visiting their aunt in the Aka village. It was like a three-month camping trip. The kids had fun living with their uh, aunt in the thatched hut and helping her with the cooking. And interesting, impressively, Kathy saw firsthand the change in the lives of these killers. Kathy wrote, I got to know Kimo and Diwe, two of the killers, because their huts were nearby. These two men were church leaders who profoundly influenced my life. I grew to love them. And this was coming from the daughter of the man who had been killed by Kimo. Kathy requested to be baptized, and the leaders agreed. This was all God's doing. My brother and I made, made a first-time-ever trip to Palm Beach, which was where their dad had been killed. It was there that Kimo and Dio baptized me, along with Steve and the two Aka children, near the grave of my father and the other four missionaries. I did not choose to have dad's killers baptize me, but I loved these men and was thrilled that they were chosen. That is an amazing story of God's grace. I mean, you would think that these people would have gone back home and started a new life back there, want to put this memory behind them. But Jesus planted in their heart a desire to connect with them. And amazingly, amazingly, the man who murdered her dad baptized Kathy and her brother. Well, before telling you the next story, I need to tell you about Ken Sandy. Do any of you know who Ken Sandy is? Never heard of him? That's kind of what I thought, which is okay. In 1989, before I left uh, Montana for Arizona, I was introduced to him. I don't remember meeting him, but I remember his name. And he is the person who found, founded Peacemakers. Um, he lived in Billings and graduated from Montana State University with degrees in engineering and law. And he started this ministry seven years before I heard about him. And here's what made Ken's ministry so effective. Even though raised by a godly mother, he didn't um, become a follower of Jesus until he started law school. After he graduated, he was living with his parents as he started the peacemaker ministry. He was very zealous. In fact, he was overzealous. He was too zealous. He was trying really hard to convert his dad, who was a retired judge. His dad was skeptical and resistant. Ken was overly aggressive. One day while they were talking, he was essentially trying to cram religion down his dad's throat. Well, Ken really offended at his dad and spoke disrespectfully to him. Finally, Ken said, I'm done and left the room for his bedroom downstairs. Well, this began Ken's wrestling with God. He said, I know I was wrong. I shouldn't have spoken so disrespectfully to my father, but he frustrates me so much. I know I should go and confess to him, but if I do, he's gonna think I'm a fool. Ken said he didn't hear an audible voice, but it was as close as you can get. Basically what I, what I heard, Ken said, was, Ken, your dad already knows you're a fool. You just made that very apparent. The question is, does he know that I am in your life and working to change you? 
that was a whole different perspective for me because my inclination was to justify myself, vindicate myself, make my case. I wanted to win. Well, through the process of talking to God, he was able to help Ken humble himself and go to his dad and say, I'm really sorry. I was disrespectful to you. I dishonored you. Well, his dad began to realize that there must be a God for his arrogant son to humble himself and apologize the way he did. He began watching Ken and seeing him change. Over the next few years, Ken's dad began to see that he was being transformed. This was a huge lesson for Ken. He thought up to that point that he was going to lead his father to Christ by impressing him with how great Ken was, how perfect Ken was, how right Ken was. I realized, he said, that that was not how we draw people to Christ. Instead, I became more transparent about my struggles, my own weaknesses, my own needs, and sharing how Jesus was working in me. My dad saw that. He saw also how he was working through peacemakers to mediate broken marriages, doing things that as a judge he knew were impossible. You never saw those things happen in courts. He more and more saw God being exalted, God's power being demonstrated. And Ken was happy to report an hour and a half before his dad passed away, his dad accepted Jesus as his own personal savior. Well, now that you've met Ken, here is his introduction to the next story that I, that I wanted to share. He was raised in Montana, as you could probably guess, used to stories about the Wild West, about cattle rustling and stealing and all those kinds of things. Thankfully, those things were a thing of the past by the time he came along, but not so for the people of northern Uganda. In addition to the oppression, they, they ex, in addition to the oppression they experienced from rebel groups like the Lord's Resistance Army, they also live under the looming threat of deadly fights with their own tribes over cattle and land. These internal conflicts claim thousands of lives each year and impede desperately needed economic and social progress. But God is raising up a group of reconcilers in Uganda who are using peacemaker ministry resources, training to turn back this tide of bloodshed with a wave of reconciliation. Ken said, the more I heard of their remarkable stories, the more I wanted to see their work firsthand. So in February of 2010, he traveled to Uganda with three other men. Chip Zimmer, who was the Vice President of International Ministries for Peacemakers, as well as Jim Roser and Mike Hildebrand, who represent some churches in Portland who were supporting uh, the peacemaker efforts in northern Uganda. During our visit, we listened in awe to testimonies of warriors, village elders, mothers, orphanage workers, pastors, bishops, judges, a presidential advisor, and the paramount chief of a two million person tribe. Over and over, we heard how gospel driven peacemaking is reducing cattle raids, gunfights, land disputes, and family violence. The resulting peace has drawn thousands to the gospel of Christ, triggered church growth, opened the door for resettlement projects and life changing economic development. He said the first tribe that they visited was called, I don't know if I'll pronounce it correctly, Karam Mojang, cattle stealing primarily to pay the bride, pi bride price. Uh, you probably understand what that is. They have to, if you have a son who's going to marry a daughter, you have to pay a bride price, and they don't have a bank account, so they go and raid somebody else's bank account and uh, get the cattle and sell them so they have the money to. Uh, finalize a marriage. So that was their way of life. But this was the way of life for 700,000 people for generations. You've heard of Idi Amin. Well, in 1979 or 1980, he fled the country, leaving behind uh, AK-47s. 
thousands of them, and they fell into the hands of the Karamajang uh, warriors, some as early as 14 years of age. Since then, 50,000 to 100,000 people, many of them only small boys herding family cattle, have been killed in bloody raids and reprisals. The two sub-tribes, the Peon and the Bokora, had previously lived peacefully near each other in a fertile area called Nabwal. But with cattle rustling and AK-47s, violence increased. They moved 30 miles apart, abandoning the fertile valley as a skeleton-covered, demilitarized zone, and living in dry lands that produced little food. Malnutrition, starvation, and violence continued to haunt both sub-tribes. Here's where Val comes in. Val Sheen was a Christian missionary veterinarian. I bet you haven't heard of a veterinarian being a missionary, but she was. And she was working with a nonprofit group that steadily built credibility by working among these tribes, taking care of their goats, their sheep, their camels. Sensing an opportune moment in 2007, she sent a copy of Ken Sandy's book to four churches who were supporting her. Um, it doesn't work, I guess, in their group like it does in our group. So these four churches were supporting Val as a missionary. And so she sent them each a book asking for um, some gray hairs. Uh, that is, those people who are seasoned and mature to be taught the principles of peacemaking and to come back to these two tribes and teach a group of people who were leaders and apparently already Christians uh, the principles of peacemaking. So that's what happened. And as a result, um, a wave of peacekeeping swept over this tribe. So much so that they were planning to train 300 people uh, with these principles. The Lord moved upon 2,500 people to move into this area where they had abandoned to be taught these principles. And uh, as a result, they, st they had a peace village established in that very area composed half of one tribe and half of another. The, AK the AK-47s were put away and eventually 9,000 others have re relocated to this area, founding 61 similar villages. Another 2,000 people have established a peace village nearby. So it is amazing how God can bring reconciliation to people. And he's, if he's illustrated it in an area in Ecuador where these primitive people didn't know anything about, uh, the only thing they knew about was revenge, nothing about self-surrender or self-sacrifice. And if they can do it in, if the Lord was able to replicate this in a, in a much more powerful way in northern Uganda, you think he can do it in America? I'm convinced he can. And what I would like to do is to ask you to join me, because if any of us have lived long enough in this world, we have been wounded, we have been hurt, we have been dealt unfairly with, and very often we don't know what to do about it. We just do like what we thought the wives of those uh, American missionaries uh, should have done, that is go back home. We leave, we separate, we disengage, we move to another city, we disconnect. We may have tried, made an effort, but I'm not wanting to jam something down your throat. What I want us to do, because as James was saying during Sabbath school, we all have this common humanity that each of us share with one another. And if we live long enough, we will be wounded by somebody. And I, what I want to do is ask you to join me in praying, praying that God will reveal to each of us what is on his agenda with respect to reconciliation. 
and that he will teach us the way to make those steps. Uh, we may not, I, I guess what I want to say, I want it to be a divine experience, not a human achievement, not a human uh, thrust into the past. But I want, to, I want God to guide us as we pray to him that we can replicate what we heard about in Aka land and in northern Uganda. We praise you, Father, for your w mighty work in Ecuador with the St Dayuma story in northern Uganda through the peacemaker ministry and in Ken Sandy's life with his own father. We're human, we're fallen, we're broken. We've been hurt and undoubtedly we have hurt others, but we know that you're in the healing ministry. You want to bring about reconciliation. You want to deepen the relationships that we have with people that have been severed. We're grateful that we serve a prayer answering God who is committed to this. And we pray that you will reveal to us your agenda, reveal through us your power. Guide us step by step through this process that your name will be praised and Jesus will be glorified for we ask in his name, amen.